Good evening, everyone. It's so good to see all of you here. Uh, and I am Charmaine Williams. I am the Dean at the Factor Inventosh Faculty of Social Work, and I have the pleasure of bringing the words of greeting today. Um, you are at the 2023 Distinguished Speaker Series Lecture. And the Distinguished Speaker Series was created by the Factor Inventosh Faculty of Social Works Alumni Association in honor of the faculty's 100th anniversary in 2014. Each year, it brings leading edge scholars and thinkers to the faculty to explore groundbreaking ideas and bring that into discourse and discussion uh, with uh, our alumni and others as we talk about crucial challenges that are facing our society. This evening, we have people joining us both in person and online, which is how life is now. And whether you are attending virtually or in the room, I can't tell you how happy we are to have all of you here for this, this annual event that we enjoy every year. And it's so nice to be doing it in person again um, now that we can. The, the Distinguished Speaker Series benefits students, alumni, researchers, and the broader community. I would like to thank our incredible Alumni Association for all the work they put into organizing this event and providing this opportunity for us to come together both in person and online to connect. The Factor, the factor in Wichita's Faculty of Social Work is truly fortunate to have such a highly engaged alumni community and it's nice to see some familiar faces in the audiences as well. We are truly grateful for all that you do and all the ways that you stay in touch with us. So a bit of housekeeping. For those of us, those of you that are joining us online, I would like to remind you that you can submit questions for the Q&A portion of the evening uh, using the Q&A button that is on the Zoom webinar screen. We will be monitoring your questions and at the end of the lecture, we will post them on your behalf while also taking questions from the audience that's here tonight. This evening's lecture is taking place during the University of Toronto's 2023 alumni reunion, during which over 100 events are taking place across the university. If you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to visit the alumni reunion website at alumni.utoronto.ca. And while this is not officially a part of the alumni reunion series events, I also want to invite you to join us on Monday, June 12th, for the first lecture in the faculty's new Social Work in Global Context lecture series. That evening at 6 p.m. we will be welcoming, welcoming Dr. Amal Elsana Aljuj to U of T to speak about her work at the intersection of community organizing and peace building in the Middle East and Canada. I hope you can join us then. Please visit our website to learn more about it and to register. It is now my pleasure to welcome the FIFSW's Alumni Association President, Andrea Allen, to the podium to provide a land acknowledgement and to introduce this year's distinguished speaker. Please join me in welcoming her. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Andrea Allen, and I'm the president of the Alumni Association. <clears throat> We're very grateful for the opportunity to celebrate our distinguished speaker with you, for those who are in person, and for those who are joining us virtually. Before we go any further, I'd like to take a few moments and do a land acknowledgement on which we're gracious, we're grateful to live and to work. I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, this land has been and continues to be traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee. Today, our location is still the home of many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, with the Mississaugas of the Credit River. To our diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis comrades, we stand beside you and express our solidarity as we live and work despite our history on this land. We all have a responsibility. We all have responsibilities to be active players in the decolonization of which we're currently 
in acting by learning, showing up, and speaking up about the injury, needs, and desires of our indigenous comrades. I must acknowledge people like myself who were brought across the Atlantic without being given a choice. People who were brought on the transatlantic trade ship of which many of us know very little. We must also acknowledge other nations who came to this land by choice through colonialism, of which many forgot that they are settlers. We give thanks to the indigenous ancestors for their patience, but acknowledge that it has been exploited. As we come from our respective homes, can we take a few moments and reflect on the indigenous peoples whose land we sit and have been misplaced as we collectively stand? We acknowledge indigenous peoples, this land, and look forward to their reclamation. <clears throat> this evening gives us great joy and pride to bring to you Dr. Moander and his recent book, Damage, Childhood of Adversities, Adult Illness, and the Need for Healthcare Revolution, written along with Dr. John Hunter. Dr. Moander, is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto. He holds the Chair of Health and Behavior at Sinai Health System. Clinically, he provides psychiatric care for people with chronic and serious medical illness. His research in collaboration with Dr. John Hunter focuses on how interpersonal relationships and psychological stress influences health and on the impact of occupational stress on healthcare workers. He's the author of three books and over 100 papers and chapters describing his work. Included in his work is our book that we will be hearing more about tonight. Dr. Melinda. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I want to thank the um, uh, Factor in Wentosh uh, Faculty of Social Work for inviting me to speak tonight, and especially the Alumni Association for sponsoring this Distinguished Speakers series. The honor is even greater because of the previous speakers um, who have participated in this series who have been a remarkably accomplished and impressive group of advocates for justice and for health. Um, and so I'm going to stretch to try and reach that standard. I have to learn how to work the technology. Um, so I do need to start by acknowledging the conflict that um, a great deal of what I'm saying tonight is drawn from the book that John Hunter and I wrote um, and that we earn royalties from its sales. And I want to acknowledge that I am going to be talking about physical and sexual abuse, and I know that that will uh, cause discomfort to a number of people. And I'm going to uh, read, at times, a couple of short excerpts and a couple of longer ones from the book, um, and so there will be swearing. So I'm going to be talking about a man who um, uh, we call Isaac, who at the time that we wrote the book, um, had been a patient of mine for over 20 years. And Isaac has had Crohn's disease since he was quite young, not, uh, not quite a teenager yet. Um, and importantly to his story, he had no way of knowing when that disease started that he had a brand new problem because it was indistinguishable from uh, the consequences of uh, abuse that he had already been experiencing for some years. It's important to um, acknowledge that Isaac has consented to everything that I'm telling you tonight and to everything that's in the book, and that I've taken steps to protect his privacy. And you'll um, perhaps notice when we get to the Q&A section that I'm very careful to not say anything about Isaac that's not already in the book. 
So you know from my title that I'm going to be talking about revolution and I'm going to be talking about relationships. Uh, and I want to be um, uh, clear at the start about why I chose those words. So first of all, everything that I'm talking about, trauma, healthcare, and healing, takes place in the context of close interpersonal relationships. Close interpersonal relationships are critical to both harm and healing. For patients and for healthcare providers, relationships are both the context for harmful interactions and for support. I'm going to talk about both sides, both interpersonal trauma and relationships that heal. Both occupational stress, which includes vicarious trauma and moral distress, as well as the support of relationships between colleagues that are restorative. And I'm going to be talking about revolution, which I use in several senses of the word. So first of all, revolution refers to upheaval. Um, and I'm uh, thinking specifically of the personal effects of working with patients like Isaac, who have turned my world upside down at times. And I'm going to talk about revolutionary relationships. And I think about my relationship with John uh, as a revolutionary relationship. It's the kind of relationship that I would hope would be available to all healthcare workers, but in fact is uh, quite exceptional. So we are friends and colleagues. We support one another in looking at the challenges of looking after patients like Isaac. And uh, we uh, work together in a way that feels safe and creative. Sometimes we offer each other what therapists would understand as supervision, uh, which means that we talk about the patients who trouble us and we help each other to maintain the best professional care and to maintain boundaries. We feel free to confront each other's blind spots and to share our responsibilities or our vulnerabilities. Most plainly, revolution refers to overthrowing the social order. And throughout this talk, I'm working towards the final section where I will talk about the things that we think need to change. And I was interested to find out that there's another obsolete meaning of revolution. It used to mean reflection in the sense of turning things over in your mind. And that's an important concept to this work too. I find that I need access to a mental space in which I can think and reflect. And that rarely comes when working face to face with a patient like Isaac. But sometimes afterwards on my own or with John, um, we're uh, able to reflect on these things and that helps the work. So I'm going to read you um, a short excerpt to introduce Isaac to you. Almost all the pictures that you're going to see have been taken by John. Um, and so this is how the book starts. Five years ago, Isaac wrote to me to describe the awful sexual abuse he had experienced as a child much more clearly than he had ever managed to say out loud over 15 years of therapy. Two hours after the next session, in which we discussed the abuse again, I received another email. Hi, Bob. I was alone again, thinking in the car how much I've had to inflict upon you over the years, perhaps now more than ever. I was also thinking that in the context of what we do, writing is an act of cowardice. Can't say it, so write it. It's the best I can do right now. For the record, you can do what you want with whatever I write. I want you to save what I've written, not for me, but for you. You can share what I've told you as long as I remain anonymous. Perhaps it will be good for both of us. I've always asked you for everything you have, no half measures. And once again, I need you to help me understand the damage I am. So this, uh, I'll read another passage. This is a little longer, um, 
uh, uh, to give you a sense of our relationship, which is close and complicated. Um, this is the story of the very first time that we met. Um, and it's from the chapter called Fucking Dead Weight, because that is what Isaac's father used to call him. When Isaac first came to see me, I thought it was to get help coping with Crohn's disease. The psychiatrists at my hospital who treat people with physical illnesses had divided up the diseases between us, and Crohn's disease belonged to me. Crohn's causes the gut to become swollen, painful, and dysfunctional, sometimes for long periods, often unpredictably. It means days with dozens of crampy, bloody, urgent bowel movements, nights lying awake with fever, sweat-soaked bedsheets, and pain. It comes and goes, often with no pattern. It is an invisible disease and elicits very little sympathy. Isaac told me that parts of his intestine had been removed by a surgeon five times, each a few years apart. Usually, people with Crohn's disease take powerful anti-inflammatory drugs to control the disease. Some need surgery, but drugs are the mainstay. Isaac, on the other hand, wasn't taking any medication when he came to see me. He hadn't found it helpful. Instead, Isaac told me that he was prepared to manage his disease with repeated operations. I've done the math, he explained. Each time they operate, they take out eight or 10 inches of intestine. The operations have been five to seven years apart. My small intestine is 20 feet long. I'm 45. I have more intestine than I have years. Why well, take the drugs? The arithmetic was right, but I'd never heard anyone speak of repeated major operations with such cold-blooded calculation. Isaac showed no hint of anxiety. He seemed to have a version of Crohn's disease that was resistant to the usual drugs, but it wasn't making him anxious, and as far as I could tell, he wasn't depressed either. So why did he need a psychiatrist? From the start, I saw Isaac's strength before he let me see anything else, and his strength was impressive. It wasn't just the surgery calculation, although that would have been enough to capture my attention. He was articulate, intelligent, a bit intimidating. His appearance reinforced the impression. He was skinny, but he didn't look weak. He wore a white dress shirt, a vest, a woolen tie, a pair of jeans that looked new, and well-worn cowboy boots. His gray hair was long and a bit unkempt. He had his own style. Isaac looked around my office. At a first meeting, people often look around nervously, but he didn't look nervous. It was more like he was taking his measure of me and waiting for his moment. And then, very quickly, he caught me by surprise and told me why he was here. I'm living in an empty apartment with a cot and a shitty radio. I moved away from my wife three months ago. I haven't bought anything for the apartment. I don't know if I'm going back home. Why did you move out? Isaac hesitated and then spoke. He had been sexually abused as a boy and had kept it secret from everyone, including his wife, ever since. He had recently broken his silence, telling his wife, Sarah, what had happened. And her response had made him feel so hurt and angry that he left their home to find some space to regain his equilibrium. He regretted having told her. But having opened the subject, he needed to talk to someone. I didn't know how to reply. Sarah had hurt him, and I didn't want to add to his obvious pain. I decided not to ask about the abuse. I asked instead what Sarah had said. Isaac explained that she felt betrayed. Learning that your partner has kept a life-defining experience from you through 25 years of marriage would shock anyone. But at that point, Isaac wasn't up to thinking about Sarah's perspective. Her response, that explains a lot, made him feel small, and then angry. But the part that Isaac could not forgive was that Sarah had told her girlfriend about it. I imagine that she needed some support, but Isaac saw only a circle of expanding humiliation, gossip and sideways looks that would say that explains a lot. So from the very first time we met, I saw Isaac's strength, and then I was invited into his most painful secret. He let me know that what made him feel safe was to be alone, by himself, with only a cot and a radio. But he also let me know that he could not survive without talking to someone. 
I was struck by the fact that he could be both a detached calculator of risks and a man so bound by shame. You could string a tightrope between those poles, so dramatic was the tension between them. In a sense, our conversations are about walking that tightrope, sometimes with grace, sometimes just clinging, trying not to fall. So I'm going to talk a little bit about adverse childhood experiences, which these days go by the acronym ACEs, and about child abuse, which is a narrower and more severe category. And this microphone is directional, so if I am looking at the slides and you can't hear me, shout. So this is a study that will be familiar to um, many people. This is a now classic study by Vincent uh, Folletti and his colleagues. It was published 25 years ago. And what they did is they surveyed the adult members of a health maintenance organization in San Diego and asked them about their experience with a number of common um, childhood stressors. And they tallied up the number of types of exposure that these adults had had when they were kids. And they used that as a score, which they compared to um, whether or not they had a whole range of adult diseases. And the infographic shows you the 10 categories of adversity that Folletti and his colleagues asked about. Physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, emotional and physical neglect and various kinds of household stress that are uh, uh, common and they thought might have consequences. And what you see over on the right are the numbers which are the prevalence of the ver those various kinds of experience. And that's now been replicated in uh, much more representative population samples in a number of states and in a number of countries, including Canada. And the numbers are quite consistent. So we can have a lot of confidence that these are the true figures that statistically uh, exposure to ACEs is the norm. So it's actually only 40% of people that score zero on that scale. And you can see the rates of uh, increasing exposure up to the highest risk category of uh, four or more ACEs, about 15 or 16 percent of the population. And in the time since that study, there has been further research that has expanded the list of the, of the types of events that should be considered as ACEs and that have similar consequences. So th these are things like being uh, badly treated because of your identity, growing up in an unsafe neighborhood, growing up in foster care, having a parent die. None of these were on the original A survey. So there's nothing specific or magic about those original 10. But the idea is the more types of uh, adverse experience that kids are exposed to, the greater the consequences later in their life. And this is the narrower and more severe category of child abuse. So this includes physical abuse, sexual abuse, or witnessing intimate partner violence in the home, which is typically witnessing violence against your mother. And what you can see is that the, that experience is uh, horrifically common. So it's one in three kids. So that's well-defined physical and sexual abuse. So some, uh, spanking, for example, would not count in, uh, in the studies that have generated those figures. And again, that's quite consistent across different uh, areas. This particular data is Canadian. This is from uh, Tracy Afifi and her colleagues. And you can see that it's gendered, that girls are more likely to be exposed to sexual abuse and boys to physical abuse. But overall, it's one in three across the board. And I want to drive that point home. So this is what Getty Images thinks that 12 people look like. So if you search in their stock photo database for 12 people, this picture pops up. So these are 12 young people who all look like they're having a better day than most of us did. Um, and I looked for 12 because it divides easily by three. Think of any 12 people. Four of them have been exposed to that kind of more severe child abuse. And typically, we don't know who those people are. So 12 colleagues, 
12 clients if you're if you see clients 12 people on the street four of them have had that kind of experience so I'll come back to that number one and three throughout so how is that related to health later in life well, looking at physical disease first, this uh, figure is showing data from the original Felitti study. So the way this works is that the number of ACEs that people reported being exposed to are the numbers on the, across the bottom there. And if they assign the uh, prevalence of a disease, in this case, case it's uh, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and say that people with no ACEs, that's going to count as one, then you can look at the kind of multiplication of that risk in people with greater exposure. And what you see is a gradient, right? So there's a dose response curve. The more ACEs people are exposed to, the more likely that they've had COBD as adults. Up until that highest risk, four or more types of ACEs category, where their risk of COPD is almost four times as high. And in the many years since that original study, much more robust research has been done that allows epidemiologists to calculate a statistic that they call population attributable risk, which means the proportion of that disease in the population that can be attributed to a specific cause. And if you look at the population attributable risk of diseases with respect to ACEs, what you find is COPD is remarkably high. So that's like one in three cases of COPD, statistically, you can attribute to ACE exposure. And there's this whole range of illnesses, asthma, kidney disease, range of cardiovascular diseases, some cancers, that also have um, higher attributable risk than I think most people would guess. And other illnesses where you can't calculate that fancy statistic, but there's consistent associations that have been found include HIV, chronic liver diseases, hepatitis. Um, and so there's this whole range of chronic adult illnesses, most of the reasons why people get hospitalized. Most of the things that contribute to early mortality have a substantial contribution from childhood adversity. Enough so that a few years ago, the American Heart Association came out with a scientific statement endorsing that the, there is substantial evidence that links childhood adversity to cardiovascular diseases, which includes heart disease, stroke, diabetes. And no surprise, with ACE being linked to such a wide range of chronic illnesses, ACEs are also linked to, to earlier mortality. So there have been longitudinal studies now that show that people with in the higher risk categories of ACEs have radically different life trajectories than people with uh, less or no exposure to ACEs. And one study that found that people in the, that category of six or more ACEs were actually dying on average 20 years earlier. So it's not subtle. So how is it related to mental health? Well, the relationships are even more robust. So this is more data from Tracy Afifi. This is Canadian data showing that common psychiatric illnesses, so generalized anxiety disorder, depression, are two to three times higher in people who've been exposed to abuse as kids, two to three times higher rates of alcohol abuse or drug abuse. And then when you look at having suicidal thoughts or actually attempting suicide, it's an even stronger relationship. So people exposed to, uh, who experience sexual abuse as kids almost eight times as likely to uh, attempt suicide later in life. And if you look at the range of mental illnesses that have been linked to ACEs and child abuse, it reads like the table of contents of our diagnostic manual. Really importantly, ACEs and abuse are not just linked to diagnoses and diseases, they're linked to suffering and a function and especially with pain. So chronic pain is um, very strongly associated with um, th those experiences as a kid. And also painkillers. So I'll give you a vignette from Isaac. So this is from a time a few years into our therapy. And Isaac came into my office one day. He was very concerned that he'd made a mistake 
that he was going to regret and was going to have dire consequences. He's often in severe pain, and it's difficult for him to get adequate treatment for his pain. And so this time he had done something extreme. He had gone out and he had forged a prescription. He had written his family doctor's name on a prescription for a drug called Fioranol. Excuse me. And the pharmacist had caught him, and the pharmacist had called his family doctor, and he thought he was about to be fired from a relationship that he really counts on. So the points to emphasize here are that it's not unusual at all for people who've experienced childhood trauma to have uh, painful conditions later in their life. And it's also common to self-medicate, to uh, try and reduce both the physical and the psychological suffering. But what Isaac had done this time is very uncommon. And it was uncommon for him. This was an aberration. So I asked him, why fioranol? It's an old-fashioned drug. It's hardly ever prescribed anymore. As opposed to opiates that are commonly used to treat pain, fioranol is this uh, combination drug. It has caffeine, it has aspirin, and it has a barbiturate, which is the dangerous part. It's a very odd choice. So Isaac explained that when he was young, he experienced his mother mostly as an absence. She was rarely around. She explicitly told the kids that she wasn't cut out to be a mother and she didn't like it. She didn't pay much attention when Isaac was suffering. And the exception was this one time when he was 11 or 12 years old and he was complaining of headaches. And so his mother gave her some of her Fioranol. She took it for migraines. This would have been in the 60s. And he loved how it made him feel. And after that, he helped himself to her supply and it became his favorite drug. And I need to emphasize that giving a child a barbiturate is a profoundly dangerous thing to do. But for Isaac, in his words, it was the closest thing to love she ever gave him. So Isaac's relationship with pain and with pain medication and with healthcare providers who are the gatekeepers to that medication is really complicated. So there's been so much longitudinal research since that Folletti study that we no longer have to talk about an association between childhood adversity and adult illness. We can be confident that the relationship is actually causal. So John and I have um, talked about childhood adversity as a cause of causes. And what we mean by that is that childhood adversity causes things that in turn cause illness and make it hard to treat. So it causes physiological changes, especially with stress physiology and pain regulation. And it uh, contributes to disease in more obvious ways by making kids more likely to smoke, or which is the link to COPD, or to drink, or to behave in other ways that put their health at risk. And the way that people adapt to adversity has an impact on how they approach relationships including healthcare relationships. So it can lead people to become anxious and dependent in a way that doesn't work well in healthcare relationships, or to become mistrustful and reluctant to engage in healthcare at all. It contributes to mental health problems and is linked to a whole range of social determinants of health. So through all these different pathways, cascading harm, uh, ACE has become linked to mental illnesses to physical illnesses to their interaction and to screwing up the relationships uh, that we would count on for effectively treating those things. So I'm going to talk about relationships. I'm going to talk about how much, how comp how much more complicated it is to practice health care when we don't know our patients' stories. And while not knowing complicates things, listening carefully creates an emotional burden, and I'm going to talk about how acknowledging trauma can be interpersonally intense. And then about how, as healthcare workers, we often defend, defend against that intensity by um, emphasizing us versus them distinctions. So here's another vignette. 
For those of you who don't know, um, diseases like Crohn's disease are often treated these days with these powerful biologic drugs. And the first one that Isaac was on was a drug called Remicade. And to get treated with Remicade, you have to go to an infusion clinic every few weeks where you're given an intravenous infusion of this drug. And importantly, these infusion clinics are on a different site, at a different site from the hospital. So the physician who prescribes the medication is not there. The drug is administered by nurses who work at the clinic. So Isaac went to the Remicade clinic for his Remicade. And early on in his treatment, first or second treatment, he had a serious allergic reaction to the drug, um, at, which made him very short of breath. So they needed to um, uh, look after the allergic reaction, which they did. But when he left, he was enraged. And when he came to see me subsequently, he was still enraged. He uh, thought that the prescribing doctor was completely irresponsible for not being there. Uh, to uh, help with the peril that he put Isaac in. So we had to work really hard for him to find a state of mind where he could figure out how he was going to approach his next appointment with the specialist so that it could be a, a constructive interaction. If he'd seen the specialist right after leaving the Remicade clinic, his grass gastroenterologist would have found his rage to be overwhelming and probably perplexing. So what the specialist wouldn't know is that the allergic reaction made Isaac feel as if he was drowning. It triggered a traumatic memory of a time he was sexually abused in a bathtub while his mother was oblivious in some other part of the house. So his reaction to the gastroenterologist and his reaction to his mother in this memory were conflated. And in both cases, he was enraged at the person who should have been protective but wasn't there. And he figured out that connection by talking about it with me. And that helped him separate these things in a way that allowed him to strategize a bit about how he was going to talk to his gastroenterologist. So now to introduce the idea of how intense it can be to talk about these issues, I'm going to read a little bit more. This is an excerpt from the chapter called You're In It With Me Now. In the first few months of therapy, I worked hard to keep up with Isaac's pace, even as I cautioned him to take his time. He described multiple events of sexual assault by the young man next door. He told me about the onset of Crohn's disease. The belly pain, diarrhea, and fatigue that are typical of that disease started shortly after the assaults when Isaac was 10. He had no way of knowing that it was a second problem. It all blurred into one. Although Isaac had felt trapped, terrified, and wordless at the time of the abuse, the feelings he was sharing with me now were different. He had a desire for revenge that he could barely contain. He felt angry and hopeless, as if by sharing his secret he had surrendered somehow. He felt humiliated, and when he talked about his disclosure to his wife Sarah, betrayed. Although we focused on the abuse and the chaotic mix of emotions that went with it, he left no doubt that he loved his children, wanted to heal his marriage, and valued our growing relationship. The first time I saw Isaac cry, he was telling me that he just needed Sarah to love him. They started marital therapy, but when Sarah revealed some mixed feelings about reuniting, Isaac went full tilt in the opposite direction. He furnished his apartment, took a road trip for a month, and then another trip into the country after he returned. I imagine that Sarah might have seen defiance and rejection at that point, but what Isaac felt was despair. I'm fucked up beyond repair. I'm so damaged. Isaac agreed to try an antidepressant drug. He started reading books about post-traumatic stress disorder and about therapy. He was walking that tightrope between despair and hope or between seeking connection and running away. And then he described a series of dreams. I'm a blind man being led down the street by my beloved dog. I'm not afraid. I have a body in a bag in the back of my car. I dig a deep hole and bury it. I want to look at who is in the bag, but I decide against it. 
I am tied to a chair. Another man is tied to a chair beside me. We are tormented by a third man who is wearing a ridiculous costume. I'm in a dark room surrounded by shapes that swarm like swallows or bats. They look like bats, but they have big genitals. They swoop by my head, barely missing me. Then the swarm swoops up and plasters itself at full speed against the wall. The splatter of the creatures smashed against the wall makes a silhouette. It is your face. The hair on the back of my neck stood up as Isaac described the final image of the fourth dream. I offered Isaac this interpretation. I wonder if those dreams are partly about what it feels like to come to therapy. Maybe I'm just looking for positive signs, but a blind man who is led by a trusty dog could be an optimistic metaphor for that choice. The body bag seems to be like some kind of darker mystery. Maybe you're not sure if you want to go there yet. The guy's tied up, I don't know. I was silent about the last dream. Although it is common for people in psychotherapy to dream about their therapist, it was unnerving to have my identity formed from smashed creatures that seem mostly to represent sexual abuse. Although I didn't say it, I was aware that I wanted to put a positive spin on that dream too, to align myself with the smashing of the creatures instead of with the bats themselves. Isaac had another interpretation. The guy tied to the second chair is you. The bat things are you. You're in it with me now. You're another captive. I came to understand that he was right. His interpretation combined the two opposing forces characterizing much of our relationship and the growing trouble I was feeling about it. On the one side is how the relationship benefits Isaac. He needs a confidant and a protector or just not to be alone. On the other side is Isaac's fearful expectation that anyone whom he brings into his world will become damaged. I already sensed that his fear held some truth. I didn't feel like I knew what I was doing. Things were moving so fast. I wasn't afraid of Isaac, but I didn't feel safe. So as healthcare workers, we tend to defend ourselves against that kind of intensity by keeping our patients or our clients at an arm's length. So there's a very long tradition of healthcare professionals, especially but not exclusively doctors, maintaining distance to protect against being overwhelmed by human tragedies. This gets carried to an extreme when we professionals start to think and act as if we're actually different from our patients, as if the difference between us and them is anything more than expert training. And because we, unlike our patients, may not be sick, at least not at the moment. Today, trainees are encouraged to write notes in which what they see is called objective and what their patients tell them is called subjective. They are taught to use unnecessary jargon, for example, substituting has suicidal ideation, or worse, just SI, for his thinking of killing himself. The jargon separates them from those who speak plain English, and it distances them from their patients' experiences. We routinely read notes written by young doctors in which they report, as they have been taught to do, that a patient claimed X and denied Y, rather than just writing that X happened and Y didn't. Their default position is to not risk fully believing what they have heard. All of this is utter bullshit. A doctor's observations are just as subjective as a patient's, but from a different perspective. We have no way of knowing when our patients are telling the truth and when they are not, but they're almost always trying to. We will all be fooled from time to time, but the value of starting by believing is far higher than its costs. Beyond being nonsensical, distancing ourselves by distinguishing between us and them is dangerous for both patients and doctors. For patients, this distance, or in its extreme forms, objectification and dehumanization devalues their experience or renders it irrelevant. When their childhood experience is the cause of their illness, distancing sets up a conversation in which the key to the puzzle is invisible or off limits. For doctors, fractured and impersonal relationships with patients contribute to ineffective practice and to burnout. It harms everyone.
That was the picture I should have been showing you. There we go. So Isaac often asks, what happened to me? In this odd, perplexed way. It's odd because he doesn't have any amnesia for what happened to him. It's just that it's discombobulating for him. John and I wrote in the conversation about the narrative incoherence that results from trauma, which is a technical description of the trouble that people have telling their own story. Early trauma interferes with skills of effective communication, especially at times of stress. The philosopher of language, Paul Grice, once identified four maxims of effective communication. Have evidence for what you say, be succinct yet complete, be relevant to the topic at hand, be clear and orderly. Unresolved trauma messes with a person's ability to do all of those things, which results in patients being experienced as what we call poor historians, which compromises their health care. Incoherence takes different forms. One person may express a great deal of emotion, too many details for a stranger to make sense of, and not provide the organizing clues that you need to put the story together. The chronology is mixed up, the character's roles are not explained, it's all detail and no conclusion. It's a narrative that invites you into a distressing world with no clear way to keep your bearings. Another person, one who's more like Isaac, may provide the audience with only conclusions, with no examples to bring them to life. If there's an emotion, it'll most likely be anger. Logic can be used as a weapon. Cliches can be used that render the story stereotypical and impersonal. The listener feels uninvited to learn more and unable to listen. It is a style that is designed to keep others at a distance. Neither of these styles help a person to be understood or to get the care they need. And one of the ways that we as healthcare providers can be useful to our patients is to develop the skills to help them become more expert tellers of their own stories. Importantly, our argument in this book does not minimize the power of the medical model and biological treatments. Instead, we declare their preconditions. A patient and I can't begin to use most of the tools of medicine until we've used its most fundamental tool, our relationship, to secure a base from which we can do our work. So John and I, oh, one last thing to read. When we talk about it later, John tells me that in fact, Isaac nailed it, you're in. He wants you in, probably needs you in, but he's afraid for you. You earned your way in and he's better off for you being there, but he's horrified by the prospect that you can be harmed like he was. You've done a difficult therapeutic thing here and it's working and good for Isaac, but he knows what an awful place he's put you in. Hang on, buddy. I sit back and let my shoulders drop. Having John in my corner allows me to do better work with Isaac. Every doctor should be so lucky. So John and I meet once a week in a meeting that has no agenda. We talk about our research. We whine about being on call. We share stories of our families. And we talk about the patients who are on our minds. We help each other out. And we're both better doctors as a result of having this safe and supportive relationship. I think it's one of the things that has kept us relatively protected from burnout while doing damaging work. In other work that I won't have time to talk about today, we've tried to understand how to help healthcare workers with all kinds of occupational stress, which has especially been a focus during the pandemic. And one of the conclusions from that work is that many of the most effective interventions for healthcare workers are fundamentally relational. So now I'm going to talk about the final section of the book, which we like to think about as a manifesto, about all the things that need to change. We address a number of different audiences in this section in turn, but tonight I'm just going to focus on healthcare professionals, especially doctors, because that's the group I know best. 
healthcare organizations, and what we can do as citizens. So our message to our colleagues is that one in three of our patients has experienced serious abuse or trauma in their home as children, and we don't know who they are. It sets them up for illness, and it interferes with getting good care, and we are operating in the dark. Operating in the dark complicates healthcare. It means we're blind to what is going on when patients find our interactions aversive or have fears and memories triggered by their medical care or require more support than we think they should need or demand more autonomy than we think is good for them. We misunderstand their symptoms and we underestimate the impact of health on function. And our own research on doctors confirms what has been found elsewhere, that outside of mental health, especially among medical specialists, medicine is practiced in a don't, ta don't ask, don't tell environment. So at an individual level, the first thing we can do to change the status quo is learn how to ask about childhood trauma. We've put a video online uh, to show professionals how to ask. And I'm not going to try and teach the care method tonight, but I want to emphasize that it's easy. It doesn't take long, and the conversation usually improves our alliance with patients. We would argue that improves their health care. It's composed of four steps. First, asking consent. Is it okay to ask some questions about early experiences that might be relevant to current health? Then asking the questions, then reflecting on the answer you get and then establishing what it is best to do next, move on or talk about it more another day or whatever. Of course, there are contexts where that conversation doesn't work, and so we also need to develop a kind of universal precautions approach to practicing healthcare, understanding that these experiences are so common that we should assume that they may well be relevant. And we need to transform healthcare organizations towards trauma-informed care, which is a huge undertaking. It involves active collaboration with patients and education and cultural shifts. And these are the crucial elements of trauma-informed care as were developed by the organization SAMHSA in the States uh, several years ago. And you can see they're actually just good principles for patient-centered care in general. And this picture is intended to make what I think is a key point, and that is that providing trauma-informed care involves recognizing that trauma occurs on both sides of the healthcare relationship. Healthcare workers have the same background risk as everybody else. Remember that one in three people have experienced substantial abuse as children, and that includes us. And furthermore, providing healthcare is a hazardous occupation. From exposure to violence, to vicarious trauma, from caring for people with terrible experiences, to burnout. So there truly is no us versus them distinction. This is a roadmap that was provided by advocates in Oregon who are ahead of the curve. And it lays out the steps for a large organization, particularly healthcare organizations to get from trauma aware, which is where we just realize there's something we need to do, to subsequent whoops, steps that they call trauma sensitive, trauma responsive, and ultimately trauma informed. It takes years of sustained effort. So I'm gonna finish up by talking about what we can do as citizens and what it's, uh, I would argue, each of our responsibilities to do. And the fundamental point to make is that we are now as a society at the same point that society was in the 60s with respect to the risks of smoking. We don't need any more evidence, the evidence is in. There are piles of roadmaps and consensus statements telling us what needs to change. What we need is public pressure that dr drives political will. And the changes that are required are broad and expensive. I've listed a number of goals there and a huge list, much too long for you to read, 
of all the strategies that lead towards those goals. And in the book, we say these strategies could compose the platform of the most unelectable political party imaginable. Because as a, as a block, they're enormously expensive. So it's helpful to reflect on the financial cost of child abuse. A study estimated that the annual cost of just those cases of child abuse reported and verified during childhood, so that is the tip of the iceberg, and just in the United States, cost the system $2 trillion per year. So the costs of really expensive initiatives uh, may very well be offset by their benefits if we can muster the societal and political will to act. And so I'll give you a case in point that is current right now. So there is a section in Canada's criminal code, section 43, which states that a, a action that would otherwise be considered assault is not considered assault if it is done by a parent or a teacher as a reasonable act of correction against a child. So there is no evidence that force is an effective correction, corrective. And there is abundant evidence that it is harmful. The sixth call to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee Commission was to repeal Section 43. And there is a bill that is um, about to or has recently had second reading in the Senate uh, whose entire text says uh, repeal Section 43. And that's been put forth by um, a senator who's a psychiatrist, Stan Kutcher. And uh, uh, Senator Kutcher's office uh, informs us that Bills to repeal Section 43 or to revise it have been put forth 17 times over the last 30 years um, and not passed yet. So there is an opportunity uh, to use our voices and there is an opportunity from time to time to use our votes to try and bring about changes like this, which would bring Canada in line with the uh, UN Convention on the Rights of Children to which we are a signatory and with a number of states in the US and a number of countries that have banned corporal punishment. And this is an infographic from Tracy Afifi um, to communicate the um, uh, evidence that they've uh, written about that spanking also should be considered an ace um, and is similarly associated with uh, uh, adult consequences as other aces are. So I'm going to finish up there with what John and I call our haiku, which if you count the syllables, you'll find out that we're cheating. It's not really a haiku, but I can't do it by memory. To treat, one needs to be trusted. To trust, one needs to be safe. And to be safe, one needs to be heard. So I'll finish up there. I'm looking forward to questions and answers and discussions. And I've posted um, uh, some of the articles that I referred to and some other resources um, on that slide. Thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed the book. I hope those who have read it thoroughly enjoyed it as well. And if you have not, I strongly encourage you to read it. And Dr. Moander, thank you for your kind and thoughtfulness that highlights the lived experiences of this client, Isaac. We're thoroughly thrilled to hear your call to action. I refer to it as a call to action um, for doctors, healthcare, students, health and child welfare organizations, parents, citizens, and patients. Everyone has a role. You didn't mention puppies. <laughs> um, <clears throat> your sharing of indicators identified in ACE the importance, demonstrated the importance of trauma-informed practice the significance of social determinants of health and the importance of relationships. 
your sharing of Isaac's story and his numerous symbols of his woundedness was well received. The sharing of the personal impact and the supports that you need to engage was also significant as a therapist myself. And the need for change was also very significant. I imagine there must be some eagerness in the audience to hear your response to issues that you provoked in the book. So let's, uh, so I see a couple of hands. Okay, let's start on the left here. Yes, please. You got a mic. You just got to pull it close. We're a retired social worker. I used to work at one of the hospitals downtown. Um, and I so believe in your philosophy that healthcare workers should be asking these questions. But from my experience, my 30 year experience working in, ho in hospitals, healthcare workers are afraid to um, ask those questions. And what they tip, my name is Zoe, what they typically do is they say, okay, let Zoe do it, let Zoe do it, let Zoe do it. And I would say, no, that we, we all need to do this and talk about the fears. But how do you overcome that? Um, that fear? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, uh, and uh, my experience is exactly like your experience, so th thanks for asking that question. And if you, if you look up the video for the care method, you'll find that it does not just say, ask Zoe to do it. The, um, because that is what usually happens. Right? Um, and um, you know, I, I showed the research about uh, how infrequently uh, doctors ask about childhood adversity. And when, when we ask them at the same time why, the list of re uh, barriers is completely predictable, right? I don't have enough time. Um, some of them say, I don't think it's relevant, although that's a relatively low number. Um, I can't find mental health care for my patients already. Why would I want to identify more reasons? Um, and I don't know how. And from talking to people rather than doing surveys, I think people um, underreport just how uncomfortable they feel with that conversation about asking. Most people just uh, are, uh, find it too daunting to enter that conversation. So even if they think it's relevant, even if we've kind of won them over with the data, they don't want to have the conversation. Um, and so um, we work, especially with, with um, especially with physicians with continuous relationships, because I like it's, it's a losing battle to try and get an eMERGE doc to think that it's going to be relevant during an eMERGE assessment, and that's probably like the last place to start. But a family doc or a specialist like Isaac's gastroenterologist who sees them hundreds and hundreds of times, many of those appointments being very ineffective and frustrating for both of them, um, there we can get a little bit more buy-in that it might be helpful if you were talking about the elephant in the room that is like the very relevant thing that you're not allowed to talk about. Um, and th what the family docs told us is the I don't have enough time thing is real, right? So like don't minimize that monitor. Um, and so if you want us to ask, you need to give us a way to ask that we can do fast, right? And it needs to be something that we can memorize and it needs to have an acronym. Like those are the preconditions of uh, an effective intervention. And so we came up with a five-minute method, and we named it CARE, um, exactly to try and help uh, coach people along. And we teach that, like we teach that to residents, and they scoop it right up. But the trouble is kind of maintaining that sort of um, practice over the course of a career, and we're not there yet, right? So we're just like uh, working at that, and it may even be kind of a generational thing. Maybe you, that has to feel relevant during your training years and then be reinforced afterwards. Because um, typically what we've done up until now is we take really empathic, great people into medical school. I won't speak about all the other healthcare facilities. And then we just squeeze the life out of them, right? And turn them into robots like us, right? Um, and so it's, it's enormous change, right? But make it practical, um, uh, emphasize its relevance and I do my best to reassure, pe reassure people that if you ask a patient about this and they tell you about it, it's new to you, but it's not new to them. You're not revealing something new that requires attention. 
you're the one who's scared of this information, right? And so it, it actually doesn't increase the, the need for uh, mental health referrals. Most people who need mental health referrals as are you know, linked to their ACEs have either already found that or already found that there's no access to it. It's like a, not a new problem for them. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, can I get the person in the back and then we'll come to you and then we'll go online. All right, someone in the back had their hand up? No? Okay, goody. Here you go. How, how do you assist someone that you're working with to experience and, and to deal with the traumatic uh, history that, uh, that they bring with to you? Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the irritating speaker thing and, and shift that around a little bit and answer a question that is just beside the one you actually asked. Um, uh, because your your question pulls for me talking about um, uh, uh, psychotherapy, which is what I do with patients like this. Uh, um, yep, I can hold this closer. The um, uh, so uh, I, I, to answer your question, I would be talking about the kind of therapy that I do with patients like Isaac, and I really want to emphasize that the reason uh, why. Uh, Isaac provides such a, a kind of important scaffold for this book, kind of going through his story, is for, for one, because he's been um, so important in my career, right? I mean, he has, he's shaped what I do. Um, but also uh, because I've been seeing him for so long that I know a lot about him. And what I'm not recommending that we do for people with trauma is provide them with 20 years of psychotherapy, right? We just like don't have the resources for that. So here's where I shift and start talking beside your question. So what, what John and I are, are really putting our focus and efforts on is not so much how do we heal the patients, which is a, a worthy question in itself, but how do we change the system so that it stops re-traumatizing them and stops ignoring like a key aspect of the, their troubled health. So we're, we're more intent on like changing our organizations and changing our colleagues and changing ourselves so that we can adapt to the, uh, the, the one in three people who've had an experience like that kind of abuse. And I do think that um, there's enough work to be done in that area. I recall one section in the book where um, <coughs> um, Isaac is seeing, I forget which specialist he's seeing, and she says, drop your pants. And he says, stick it up your ass. <laughs> I thought that was funny. I thought it was just, you know. Maybe I've thought of saying that a couple of times <laughs> myself, but, you know. Um, um, let's do what's online. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna start with a question from Sue. What can patients do from our end to let health professionals know the reason why we might feel extra vulnerable in health settings? That's, that's a great question. Um, so the, um, uh, again, it's, it's an easier question to approach in a, re in a relationship that has some kind of continuity. Um, uh, 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 because it takes courage to raise an issue where you haven't been asked a question, right? And so you need, some, you need to already have established a reasonable alliance and have some sense that this is a safe place and that I have sufficient trust that I can raise this question. And if you don't, then your, question, then your, your challenges are more fundamental, right? It's like, how can, I, how can I find a relationship that's safe and trustworthy enough that I can talk about the things that I need to talk about? Because you can't, if, you're, if the relationship doesn't um, support that, then, it, then it's not a good idea to introduce things that you, you can't trust are going to be handled well. Um, uh, but so I would like encourage uh, asking for a special appointment so that it's not competing with the the uh, you know other three concerns of I've got a family doctor in my mind, um, and 
if it makes it more comfortable for you, bringing somebody with you, it's like we often encourage um, people, we encourage people generally to do whatever it takes to feel safe, because if you don't feel safe, you can't do anything else. And that might mean extra time, it might mean having a person with you, it might mean a little bit of uh, kind of foreshadowing what you have to, what you're planning to talk about so that you're not uh, uh, worried about catching somebody by surprise. It's terrible that you need to kind of manage your relationship so much, but in fact you do. Okay. Um, I think, uh, Charmaine? Um, I just want to start by first saying just how much I appreciated the talk. And um, I'm, I'm feeling renewed you know, gratitude for the person who suggested you as a speaker because it feels like the right talk at the right time for our times. Um, and reflecting on your remarks, um, I, I've been thinking a lot about uh, some of the people I meet in research and that I used to meet in practice who not only had those childhood experiences but accumulated more and more traumas as they went into adulthood and I'm also thinking about ourselves as, you know, human service professionals that carry our own traumas. So um, I, I wanted to ask a question to get you to spend a bit more time on something you sort of alluded to, the need for us to actually care for ourselves in some way. And um, I'd love to hear your comments on what self-care means or what being healthy as a social worker or, or a doctor, whatever means, given all that you've seen and learned. Uh, again, that's a, it's a really good question, I, and I'm, I don't know if my answer is going to do it justice. I think I'm going to ramble a little bit, and I'm going to leave it to you to try and organize my thoughts into something that are better than what I actually said. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a really important question. The first thing that comes to mind is I've got a, a, a colleague at our hospital who is in the senior management and is, is the one who is advocating for uh, us to incorporate becoming a trauma-informed organization. Um, which requires like getting it into the strategic goals, which requires, you know, people actually having responsibility for it and it be having a column in the budget. Like, you know, you can't get anywhere unless something kind of is official in that way. And his point is that for us to be an effective trauma-informed organization, we have to attend to the trauma of our staff, right? So we have to recognize that, um, uh, it is the norm for nurses to be exposed to violence, right? That um, uh, occupational stresses of all kinds, which we're all like super familiar with because we've just been through three years of this horrible aberration, um, are are the norm in, in healthcare work. And the um, traditional response to that, which has been like resilience training, right, which is, I've got this cartoon that I didn't put up here, which is like a, this painting of a seascape storm at sea, and there's two seas being or two ships being battered around by all the waves, and the, the balloon over one of the ships says, "Let's teach the sailors to be more resilient." Right, um, and uh, there's a shift from that towards um, organization shifting culture so that um, we don't. I think we can't always help individuals or, or, or sustain individuals completely, but we can for sure not make it worse, right? Um, and so when um, understaffing and overworking and real and perceived dangers at work and um, strained collegial relationships and all that kind of stuff are uh, uh, making an important contribution to burnout, the changes that that calls for are organizational. At a personal level, um, I think it depends on who you are, right? I mean, the, um, the ways to sustain oneself and care for oneself depend very much on what works for you. I know what works for me is going home to my family um, and going out on weekends to green spaces and blue spaces and taking pictures of birds. Like, that's what is restorative for me. I would hardly prescribe that to you, right? Um, and for somebody, for somebody else, going home to family is not a restorative idea at all, right? So like we kind of need to um, give people permission to play to their strengths and try not to make it harder for them. And, you know, uh, everybody should have a John. Very novel. <laughs> all right. Um, 
Terry, did you have your hand up? <laughs> oh. And then I think you in the blue, and I think someone in the middle there, and one person over there. Oh, and you've got, oh, and time is running. <laughs> well, it just, um, I was thinking of, uh, I don't mean the uh, simplistic resilience ideas, but I have found working with younger people, there's a tremendous strength that often gets overlooked. We infantilize them, oh, poor you, you've had a hard life. Instead of looking at their abilities and like use that to go forward. And in fact, peer work can be fabulous, right? The strengths that a lot of these young people, they've been through it. They're not little kids, even if they are 16. And um, so I thought that, and also research on well, the people that have had the traumas and have done well, is the research to show what are those characteristics that made it for them, and can we learn from that? Yeah, so I'll, um, um, uh, I'll try and be quick. For sure, um, effective trauma-informed care is strength-based, right? So it, the, one, of the, one of the first priorities is to identify your client or your patient's strengths, allow them to tell you about their strengths. That's one of the reasons why the anecdote of uh, Isaac's first meeting with me found its way into the beginning of the book. Um, because if, uh, if I hadn't had the opportunity to be so impressed with Isaac's strength, I wouldn't have heard the rest of that story, right? And, but it's, it, that comes about in different ways in different settings. So as you say, like in, um, uh, in, in some peer groups, the, the strength is, is in the group or in working with each other or, you know, I'm making up stuff about your examples, but, you know, maybe it's in the sports that they're playing that, that precede and follow the conversations that are being had, right? I mean, the, the strengths are, are, are really important. Um, and the research about what's make people resilient, there is some. Uh, there's not nearly as much research about that as there is about what breaks people down. Um, uh, and uh, I will oversimplify in a way that reinforces what I want to reinforce, which is that it's relationships, right? Relationships are healing and restorative. Uh, kids, adults, you know, people can have terrible experiences and if they have that in the context of good, protective, supportive, responsive relationships before and after, it's not, it's not that harmful, typically. Um, and the, um, which I, I think is one of the reasons why there's such a spectrum of outcome from these uh, terrible early experiences. Um, and there are probably some other protective factors. Surprisingly, things like money are, are not that protective. Um, so, um, but it depends very much on kind of what else is there to compensate for the trouble that the, that the harm is causing. Thank you. Um, I am aware of the time. Let me do a check with you. We're over time even. Could I get one more question? <laughs> the three of you, I think the, the next hand I noticed was right behind you, Dale. I'm sorry. Um, we have a reception after. Maybe we can catch some pieces there, but please go ahead. Hi, my name's Andrea. Um, I wrote you an email about my experience, and um, so I'm on the opposite end. I have a very high ACE score, seven or eight, um, and I went through at midlife three crisis illnesses, cancer being one of them. So uh, one thing I loved about your lecture was the narrative piece. And I'm of the ramble type, <laughs> so I'll try not to. But uh, so entering the hospital with my symptoms and my state of, of being triggered in the hospital um, over the years of, of being diagnosed over and over again, uh, misdiagnosed, I came to the conclusion being short and to the point got me way better treatment than my initial panic ramble. And I think that would be a great psychoeducation piece in every waiting room. Uh, if you're high anxiety, this will help you get better diagnosis. And um, the other piece was, I kind of, you mentioned ER being a difficult place, 
but that is where I was mislabeled as anxious rather than than taking my actual symptoms serious. So I'm wondering if there's a way, I know it's gonna be hard, but how could you get this information to ER doctors in a way that doesn't go too deeply into it, but doesn't have them discount someone like me who has real symptoms as Thank being you. neurotic or anxious? Yeah. Um, so I will do my best to answer. I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to answer about somebody like you, not about you, because I don't wanna I don't wanna try to pretend to know what's good for you. Um, and the a uh, couple of things come to mind. So one of them is John and I put these videos on on YouTube from time to time, um, and one of them is uh, uh, what to do when visiting the doctor makes you anxious. Right? And in there, one of the tips is, and we're, but we're thinking about things that you can predict. Going to the emergency department is way higher stakes because you have no prep time and, the, and you're like obviously feeling really sick you wouldn't be there. But, um, but the advice is much like what you say, right? It's think about what you want to get out of those appointments. You know, put your bullets in a line, put them in order of priority, and then throw them all away except for the top three, right? Because that's all you're going to get to talk about and have that in your mind before you go in. Um, another, which is, is more applicable in the emergency department, is uh, if it's possible for you within your circumstances, don't go by yourself. Right? Um, because if you've got a pair of ears and a, and a not sick, more articulate mouth at the gurney side, uh, it's much easier to try and negotiate those kinds of uh, interactions. I, I don't know if there are any solutions for how we can kind of clue the, uh, all of the, the healthcare staff in an emergency department, including the emergency doctors, into this. I mean, we can, you know, it's easy to put information into an electronic health record, but it's a real wild card what is going to happen with that information, right? And so for one person, it's really helpful. For one physician or nurse, it uses it in a way that's really helpful. For somebody else, it's just stigmatizing. It's just another reason to think you're just anxious. Right, so it's. Um, I don't know that there's an easy solution to that. Thank you, thank you. I wish to thank you formally. Thank you again, um, Dr. Moander, on behalf of the Alumni Association. We're very grateful for this book. We think it will indeed catapult that revolution. Um, the need for change and the movement away from half measures is significant and critical to address that narrative incoherence you, you wrote about and you just spoke about. Um, um, yeah, the question of what happened opens up doors to build relationships of trust and then safety. So Dr. Moander, thank you for allowing us to promote and share this detailed call to action. And thank you very much for the evening. Thank you all for coming. Thank Thanks you. so much for having me.